Welcome to Chopsticks Alley Art Tongue Lecture Series. We're so excited to have all of you here today. And um, we have a special program prepared for you with um, our artists. And I'd like to introduce everyone so that way you all know who um, is on screen with us. So first I have our producer Esther Young with us this morning. Hi everyone, thank you for joining. So Esther is going to be helping us manage all of the chats, both on Facebook as well as on Zoom. And we're going to ask all of our um, audience to please um, mute yourselves and also remove yourself from camera. That would be very helpful for us. Um, and we are going to introduce Emma. Emma is this wonderful person that I had the pleasure to meet about two and a half years ago. She's a designer. We, um, someone introduced us to her and I think she's going to share that story in a little bit. But um, Emma is born in Vietnam, raised in San Jose. She was a pre-pharmacy major at USC before discovering her love for design and switching majors halfway through college. Doesn't that sound completely um, familiar <laughs> with everyone? And she basically started designing beautiful and purposeful brand experiences for in-house creative teams and freelance clients such as Blue Wolf and an IBM company, Facebook, Pinterest, and currently ServiceNow. She lives a life through the lens of design, constantly curious, collecting experiences, and always creating. So welcome, Emma. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so a little bit about Chopsticks Alley before we begin. First, we want to thank all of our donors. Thank you very much. If you still like to donate, we, you can do so on our website at chopsticksalleyart.org. And it helps us continue to provide these type of programs. So Chopsticks Alley, we support Southeast Asian artists by featuring them in programs such as this, as well as events and exhibits. And we like to promote the Southeast Asian cultural heritage through the arts because it is a wonderful way to do it where how we can all connect. So without further ado, why don't we have Emma uh, share her screen and get started with this very important topic of how do you earn money as an artist? I mean, come on, all of our parents think that we're going to be starving artists. Emma looks pretty good. Is that your real living room, Emma? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually not, but I'm actually in the process of moving right now, but you know what? At some point. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so uh, sure. why don't we Talk have Emma take it away? Hi everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you about how to build a thriving creative career in tech, because I don't think that's something that you often hear every day and also especially not from an Asian American uh, designer and artist. And so like Trami had just mentioned, I was born in Vietnam and I immigrated to uh, San Jose, California when I was about eight years old. And I went to school down at USC, uh, the University of Southern California in LA. And so now I'm back in the Bay Area and working mostly in tech. So these are the different companies that I've been at. I started my career out at Blue Wolf and IBM Company and that's a Salesforce consulting agency, which is more, you know, business to business, B2B, and then kind of shifted my lens going into Facebook and Pinterest, which I think are brands that you're probably familiar with, uh, but more on the B2C side, business to consumer. And then recently I went back and now I'm working on the global brand team at ServiceNow, which is a digital workflows company. So all, you know, within in-house creative teams on tech brands. So that's where, um, you know, where I'm coming from. And I've picked up a couple lessons along the way, some funny stories that I'll share with you today. And so with that, I'm gonna just jump straight into it. I have three tips on how I've been able to build a thriving creative career. And the first one is just, it's so simple, but kind of hard at the same time. It's to ask for what you want. And it's hard because first, you gotta figure out what you want to begin with, right? And for me, when I went to college, I didn't necessarily know what I wanted. And I chose pharmacy because my mom told me, you know, maybe be a lawyer or a doctor. So I chose something in the sciences and I wanted to make them proud. But I struggled for like a good two years um, at USC because it was just not a passion of mine and I had a hard time. But then at the same time, I found other creative outlets that made me happy. Like 
uh, you know, doing websites for student clubs and then creating like photoshopping posters to promote all our events. And that's when one of my friends over in the marketing school, uh, her name's Catherine, she noticed all the work that I was doing for these clubs and suggested that I check out design. And I put design in air quotes because I had no idea what it was at the time. I'd never heard of the word design. And I think it's because I wasn't surrounded by creative people growing up, or at least people, you know, in my immigrant community who, who pursued creative careers. And so that's when I started to open up my world a little bit. So I took some art classes in the art school at USC, uh, painting, sculpture, all things that were suddenly like so exciting and fun for me. And I was starting to do well in school again. And it just exposed me to this, you know, whole new world. And I remember one of my classes, it was a design history class where I, these big names in the industry, like these design legends who would have careers well into their 60s and 70s, I think some of them even 80s. And I thought to myself like, dang, like they must love what they do and are able to make a living out of it. So the more I learned about it, the more I was starting to figure out that I really love art and design, like something creative, right? And at the same time, I was also landing internships and web design gigs and realizing that people were paying me and I could make a living doing what I enjoy. And I, that's when I you know, decided to follow my passion. Halfway through college, I switched my major from uh, biochem to fine arts. And I graduated with a fine arts degree with a focus in design. So now after graduating, I spent a solid three months just working on my portfolio, polishing up my portfolio, updating all of my social media pages because one of my managers back at my internship gave me this wonderful advice to make sure that my LinkedIn was updated. LinkedIn was kind of new at this time, but after applying to about like 60 or so companies, I was really trying to put myself out there at the beginning. Someone reached out to me on LinkedIn from a company named Wuwa. And so that's where I started my journey. It's a small team. I think there were about three of us creatives, but on this uh, startup company, so 500 people, which meant that, you know, you got to wear a lot of hats and I got to try a ton of different things, which was great because, you know, even though at this point I had figured out that I love design, I didn't really know what kind of design, you know, I, I, I didn't really know what else was out there. And so at the beginning, it was a lot of like emails, infographics, PowerPoints, and I was just excited to try everything, right? It was good. It was just good practice for me. So I love taking all of these things. But over time, I realized that this, I didn't find this kind of work that exciting until I got something uh, printed works, like the one you see on the right here. So there's just something so uh, exciting and satisfying about, you know, working on this piece of work on the computer and then having it printed and then you can hold it in your hands and it's tactile. Uh, that was just so exciting for me. So then I started to ask my manager for more print projects. And I would get things like this world-class facilitation guide, or that led to me making this like elevate field guide. And then it eventually led me to getting the opportunity to print, uh, design our biggest print project at Blue Wolf, which was the annual state of Salesforce. So it's this 40 plus some pages of, you know, infographics and layouts and uh, curated photography. And honestly, I didn't learn how to do this in school. So, you know, you don't necessarily have to know everything going into, into your work. And so I spent the a solid like two, three months reading up on grid systems, on how to design magazines, how to design infographics and data. And I also had a really supportive team where we would do weekly critiques and we would spend those critiques talking about what works, what doesn't work. And from those conversations, that's how I would learn to get better at this. Um, and I remember at one of the critiques near the end, my manager asked me how much longer I needed to wrap this project up. And I told her, you know, probably about a day or so. And she asked me, is that enough time for you to typeset? I had never heard of typesetting before. <laughs> so in the back of my mind, I was like, what's typesetting? I need to do that. <laughs> um, nevertheless, this project turned out well, but it was honestly, truly a process of learning by making. And so by this time, I did a lot of print work. 
I mean, I did our biggest print project of the year. And so I couldn't help but wonder, you know, what's next for me? What, what else can I do? Can I have more responsibilities? Can I do something bigger? And eventually I got to uh, design for Blue Wolf's Dreamforce, which is our biggest, you know, ad campaign of the year. And for those of you who haven't heard of Dreamforce, it's, I think it's one of the biggest tech conferences. It's held by Salesforce and they bring in about 170,000 people to San Francisco for this. And Blue Wolf always goes in with a big campaign for this event. Now, a couple months before this, Blue Wolf was acquired by IBM. So there were tons of changes. On my team, senior leadership left. Uh, the design director was gone, the brand director was gone. And so all of a sudden, I was the most senior person on the creative team, which is nuts because, you know, I'd only been there for like two and a half years. But, you know, I had to step up and take the biggest campaign of the year, which was super nerve wracking because a lot was at stake, right? We were full of an IBM company now. But uh, I was at the same time so excited about all these different design applications that I hadn't gotten to do before. And I'll share with you um, a little bit of that today so you can see the kind of range and how design shows up in the world in so many different ways and what you could do. So we did advertising like what you see here throughout San Francisco and on buses. We also designed spaces like uh, this pop-up lounge that we created. So, you know, designing the graphics on these walls. And then we had events throughout the city as well. And at those events, we would brand the spaces going from big things like, you know, large signage that we would work with the local print studio to print all these out and install it down to little details like the, the you know, things you see on the tiles here. And then when it came to, you know, going beyond 2D, there were also, it was my first time like playing with digital and 3D as well. We worked with a digital production studio to create this tunnel, this build that they installed in um, this event. And then they set up projections throughout the space. And some of those projections, it would notice, uh, you know, the motion happening around and it would uh, respond to that motion. So it was really cool to work with this, uh, you know, new way of doing design. And we also had an in-house uh, videographer and motion designer to create some of this as well. And so because I asked for a challenge, it, it really expanded my world of design and expertise in terms of different mediums, right? Here you see print, digital, environmental installations. And I also got to lead and collaborate with other creatives that I hadn't gotten to partner with before, like videographers, animators, event planners even, you know? And so this project turned out to be a pretty good success. And now, once you figure out what you want, or at least have a general direction, then you gotta let people know so that you don't know, ask for those opportunities. So at this time, I, I felt like it was, you know, all that I could do at a startup like Blue Wolf. And so I got curious about other brands. Like, can I design for other brands? How can I apply what I've learned here to, to somewhere else? Or, you know, learn how other teams operate. I was just so curious about that. And so that was when I decided to branch out a little bit. And I went from working comfortably full time at a company to taking a little risk and starting to contract. Some of the contracts were as short as like two months, you know, to which I was like, what happens afterwards? I don't know, but it turned out okay. Um, so asking for what you want, I've realized, is not just about asking for the, the projects or the opportunities that you want, but also asking for what you're worth. For me, contracting meant I was interviewing like crazy, negotiating like crazy, talking to so many different companies, and that's when I realized that I was underpaid but that I was able to charge more. Because to one person, you know, I would ask for a number, if they would say yes, to the next person I would ask for a little more. And that was how I kind of eventually started to ask for a number that I didn't even think that I would see until I was 30 years old, but they said yes. And so I think there's this misconception that artists or creative people don't get paid much. And I think creatives themselves kind of perpetuate this like starving artist stereotype, thinking that they shouldn't ask for that much or charge that much for this thing that they love to do. But what I've realized is creativity is a valuable asset. And it's only a small group of people that can do it really well. And so, you know, make sure that you ask for what you want. And the next thing is, 
when those opportunities do come, oops, let me go back one. When those opportunities do come, you got to say yes, even if you don't think you're ready. And so I think I've had, you know, a decent amount of success up until this point, but I would be remiss if I didn't share with you a story of when I failed hard. And that was with the Pinterest holiday campaign. So, you know, same thing. There was kind of shifting leadership around this time and I was handed this brief and I do what I usually do. You know, I kind of just run with it and I try to do my best and try to figure it out and just drive the project. And so I saw an opportunity to do a photo shoot. I, I've always wanted to do one. And so I saw that opportunity. I pitched it to the marketing team uh, who the brief came from and they absolutely loved the idea. Um, I, they loved the photo shoot idea that I pitched. And so we were off and running. But I had never done a photo shoot before. <laughs> but, you know, every time there's a new challenge, you know, like the state of Salesforce that I mentioned before, I just try to learn as much as I can. I read up on it. I talk to other people who did it. So there was a gal at Pinterest who recently did a photo shoot. I sat down with her, you know, after who she worked with, what steps she took. And I was just going to emulate that and try to figure it out as I go. Um, and I thought that was enough. But sometimes you don't even know that you're not ready. And with my naive enthusiasm, I kind of led the team down the path of this super, you know, expedited photo shoot, right? We only had a month to, to do this. And as the date got closer, um, an art director came in to help and guide me. And when I showed him some of the mockups, he asked me, did you storyboard the shootout? Tell me more about the storyboarding. <laughs> um, and then he asked me, do you have a props list of the exact things that you need on the shoot? Oh, I thought the photographer handled that. <laughs> and so, you know, after a series of these questions, I like rushed back to my desk. I um, hustled and I tried to pull all these different pieces together and fill in the gaps of, you know, the things that he pointed out. And a couple of days later though, you know, even after sharing the, the new updates that I had, we realized it was just not enough right for for a shoot that short of a time and so he made the the hard decision but but the smart decision to you know restructure the campaign a little bit re-strategize it to that we can postpone a photo shoot and so what you see here is what we launched the campaign with just using stock photo to buy us a little bit more time and so now with a little bit more time the second part of the campaign came together much more smoothly and I was, you know, getting a lot of coaching and guiding throughout this process as well. So we worked with a local Asian American photographer, Michelle Min. And this entire process taught me about all the things you need to do to prepare for a photo shoot, which is a lot. So you need to storyboard and plan out, you know, frame by frame exactly what you need. And then you need a, you know, exact props list, maybe even links of where you can get those items. And then you need a product stylist who's, you know, going to be on set to make sure that things look the way that they do. Or food is challenging because cold things melt. <laughs> so all the intricacies of building a photo shoot. And part of that learning too was me giving myself the opportunity to fail, even though it's painful, but I came out of it knowing much more than I do now. So I know how to run a shoot. I'm much more prepared. I'm much more adaptable when I go into these situations. And I discovered a love for studio photography. Like after doing this project, I just could not wait to get to do more studio photography and try my hands at more photography. And so all of this, you know, was the process of me learning and trying to figure out what I love and what I don't. And so that brings me to my final point, And that is to learn what you love and love what you learn. And you never quite figure it out. That's what I want to point out. Like you never just arrive at like, okay, this is what I am and this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Because, you know, you, you change and the world changes and everything's constantly evolving. Everyone's constantly evolving. So for me, the process didn't stop when I switched my major in college. I'm constantly trying to learn and trying to level up, which is fulfilling for me, but also valuable for the people that I work with. So I'll give you a couple examples of that. Like one of the things that I love learning is how to run a business. So outside of work, I also do freelancing on the weekends and evenings, like making the logo for Chopsticks Alley. Um, also led me to, you know, meeting wonderful people. 
So selfishly, I just want to put on my entrepreneur hat and make cool designs. But this also benefits me at my day job because it, you know, develops this kind of process minded brain and allows me to be able to manage my own projects, manage my own clients at work, which makes me more valuable as an employee because then I can be able to give more than just, you know, design at where, where I work. And then on my free time, I love just exploring a vast world of art and design, trying to figure out what my specialty is, maybe my style. At a certain point, I was wondering, should I pursue illustration? So I assigned myself a passion project. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that concept, it's pretty much just a self-directed project, right? You kind of act as your own client, give yourself a brief parameters, perhaps for me, like I was just, you know, only using these four colors. And so with 36 days of type, which is what you see here, it's an annual Instagram challenge. And if you're interested in this, I definitely um, suggest you check out the hashtag on Instagram. There's tons of beautiful artwork on there. But the idea is that you post a piece of lettering art every day for 36 days. I did 26. Um, and this project totally stretched my digital illustration skills. And I honestly didn't expect for it to lead to anything because it was just an experiment for myself but people were asking me for prints afterwards. So it opened up this possibility to sell art that I hadn't anticipated. So your interests can turn into something beautiful and profitable, and you can create new avenues for making a living. And beyond that, I generally, my exploration can go really wide as well, right? With different mediums, different styles. Like here you see chalking, collage, photography. Right now I'm working on a custom typeface. And I show you this because I actually have some of this stuff on my portfolio, which I think has helped to make me stand out as a candidate, right? Because everybody has client projects, but because design is always evolving and new technologies impact how we work, how we create, companies want to keep up. And so when hiring managers see this, you know, other side of you, they see someone adaptable, they see range of skills and they see a drive and a motivation. Um, and so having a constant curiosity and, you know, the drive to learn and experiment allows you to not only become a multidimensional creative, but other people will see that. Hiring managers will see that. Clients, future collaborators, and they will recognize that, you know, you're one cut above the rest with the experimentation and the curiosity and learning. So for me, I've been able to build a thriving creative career by always asking for what I want, by saying yes, even if I don't feel like I'm ready. And lastly, learning what I love and love what I learn. And this cycle of leveling up, bringing more of me to my design practice, more value to other people that I work with is, you know, all the different gears to this creative engine. And I actually do want to add a little thing. I know I said three, but there's one consistent thread that I've realized across all of my experiences, and that is people. I am where I am because of all the people that have helped me to get here, right? It started with Catherine, who first pointed me in the right direction to begin with. I always credit her for like changing my life because otherwise I, I, I don't think I would be very happy in the sciences. And then it was my manager at Blue Wolf who gave me all these opportunities to explore print, explore digital and Dreamforce. And then that really kind art director at Pinterest who was so patient in guiding me through that photo shoot process. And, you know, the teams of illustrators and animators that I've mentioned before who made these projects possible. So you got to invite people into your journey because people matter. They're the ones that make it fun and meaningful. And I hope that, you know, me sharing about all these different types of creators in the industry and the different types of projects that I've been able to work on has helped you realize that there's a big world of art and design out there. There is a viable industry for creativity. And so if this has, you know, become helpful for you in your career, I'd love to follow along in your journey as well. Uh, I'm on Instagram and Twitter, and I hope to connect with you. And if you have any further questions that we don't get to in the Q&A today, feel free to DM me. Thank you so much, Emma. That was really amazing um, sharing your personal journey. So that really helps us set the tone for today's talk. And we're also opening this up for the audience to ask questions. Um, and because 
uh, we have time. We're going to, uh, if you have a question, we're going to have you unmute yourself and get on camera if you'd like to ask the questions. So while everyone's getting ready to do that, uh, we have some questions from parents, right? So one of the question is, um, was it hard to get an internship? Was it easy? How do you get an internship? Mm, so actually I got a couple of different internships and gigs while I was in school. Um, so for me, it was really good that I had a community and an alumni network. Um, so I just literally used the job postings that we had at USC. I think it could be difficult and could be easy depending on where you are in your process. I remember there was this one place that I had applied to and I was so excited about potentially working there. But at the time, this was my sophomore year. So I was just discovering art and design. I wasn't that good. And so they rejected me. But the following year, I had another year of experience. I had been doing more art and design. So I submitted to that same place again and I got the internship. And so I think it's, you can definitely get internships and gigs as long as you're, you know, pushing again, that constant creativity to push your projects and polish up your portfolio and improve. You sound like someone who doesn't give up. I think that's a very important <laughs> skill to have. Uh, persistence, yes, definitely. And not just in the artistic field, but I think in life, you just have to be so persistent, right? Like I have like a chihuahua and he's always like, I want to get on the bed. I'm like, no, not tonight. And he's like persistent. Like it, he doesn't <laughs> stop, right? It's almost like you have to be that way in any field that you choose. Would you say that's accurate? <laughs> oh, for sure, yes. One of them. Um, Gosh, it was my chief marketing officer back at Blue Wolf. She gave me a really wonderful tip of advice. And that is, if you ask for something and people say no, it doesn't mean no. It just means maybe not right now. <laughs> so ask again later. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, you know, with, uh, and I don't want to generalize, but like me being, you know, Asian and me being uh, female, like when you're told no, I think often you do kind of just take it verbatim. But mm -hmm. over time, I've realized, like, just that piece of advice that she gave me that, you know, there's, there's another pathway. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's definitely true. In our upbringing, there are um, the persistent thing we don't really do, unless we're talking about, oh, you know, like, work really hard to earn money for your family. But we never really encourage that. Pursue your dream and be persistent about pursuing your dreams, right? So there's, mm -hmm. it's like almost like this um, duality and, and opposition in what we teach our kids, It's right? Um, mm -hmm. So an, another th question I have for you is what advice do you have for parents who are pushing their kids towards some kind of set, you know, field? And mm -hmm. it may be a fit or it may not be a fit, but what, what advice do you have for, as a parent, should they do that? Um. Um, so, so I'm not a parent and so I can't give parental advice, but I can give the advice from the perspective of a daughter who has found a fulfilling career. And um, I, w I would say two things. I think the first thing is exactly what my parents did. And that is just to be supportive all along the way. I remember calling up my parents, uh, I think it was my mom, and it was like sophomore year, and this was when I decided to change my major. I told her, mom, I'm gonna change my major to fine arts and do design. And she had no idea what the heck I was talking about at the time. And I still think they don't really know what I do, even though you know I've shown the pictures. Um, but they've always just you know, been like, yes, we trust you, you know, just go do your thing. And they, I, so I think, you know, being on the sidelines and then cheering them on every step of the way, even if they make, you know, the wrong path, they'll at least know that that's not the right path. And then, you know, we can figure and go another way, but you got to let them make those decisions and discover these things for themselves. And then, um, the second piece of advice is something that I wish that I had, um, and that is to be exposed to all the different possibilities of what I could do much earlier on than being exposed to it all in college. Like I, you know, I could have started to develop that in middle school and high school and then been not wasted those two years of my college, you know, career. Um, and so if you have the resources, definitely expose your kids to the things that you think they would be interested in. And if you do recognize that they maybe have a skill set towards something, then, you know, nudge them in that direction and give them more resources in that direction. So that's what I would say for parents. 
Yeah, I'm in, I'm in full agreement with you there because um, the exposure aspect is super important. Uh, and I'll share a little bit of my experience and then Esther can chime in. Um, so I, I never thought about p pursuing a career in the arts field because you know, like what we hear, you're never, you're never gonna make any money, you'll be a starving artist. And then this opportunity came up for me to um, consult or work with the San Jose Museum of Art as a coordinator for the Vietnamese community. And I thought, okay, I'll try something new. So that's something that you said that I really love is always say yes and then figure it out. <laughs> yeah. So if they're watching, it's like, uh, anyway. So it was in that moment, I'm like, I'll say yes, I'll figure it out, you know. Um, but once I was in working at a museum, I realized there's this whole world of um, jobs available in the arts field. So you don't have to be a fine artist. You don't have to mm -hmm. be painting, you know, Picassos, whatever. But you can still work in that field. There are administrators. There are um, people who, if you like to do build things, there are people who build sets. There are people who work in education. You know, there's so many aspects. And I, I feel like as a person, as an individual, I don't think I'm like this creative artist, but I do enjoy the artistic field because it's not so confined. Mm -hmm. I enjoy working in the art arena because there, I'm exposed to so many different things. So that's something I would encourage parents is don't just think they're, they're going to be an art starving artist because they choose a field in the arts. Instead, like what you say, Emma, expose them to different things that they could do. Um, as a job, as a profession to earn money. So I, I really appreciate you saying that too. Yeah, and I love how you bring up the point, like after you would enter the museum, that's when you discovered more about what you could do. That's how I feel too. Like the more I learn, uh, like even though, you know, you can argue that art and design is kind of a small world. The more I learn about it, the more I realize there's, there's so, it's just a, a huge thing. Like the more you learn, the bigger it becomes and the more you could do. So if, I don't know, for me, it feels like an endless source of inspiration, an endless source of just things that you could explore. Yeah. And let's face it, we're underrepresented in the arts field and partially because, you know, as immigrants, as refugees, the first order of business is to earn money. I get it. I get what yeah. our parents had to do. So now it's time to tell our parents, okay, you guys worked hard for what? So that we can have a better life. Well, I'm old now, but for you guys <laughs> to have a better life. And so now give you the opportunity to explore that better life and then to guide. So instead of mm -hmm. saying no and shut it down, because you know, if it's someone who really loves the art, they're going to pursue it anyway, right? But they're going to mm -hmm. do it on their own. They're kind of lost or confused. Why not be that guide, right? Open those doors for them. You might know someone who work in the arts or you might know someone who knows someone. Let mm -hmm. them be exposed. Let them go to that museum. Let them sit down or shadow someone um, in the arts field, like, like you, right? So um, let me ask you a question, Emma. Do you, um, do, are you a mentor for anyone else? Is that important to you? I honestly have not had any formal mentor mentee relationships um but i absolutely love talking about this industry what i do what i can offer and as you have seen i've you know encountered multiple failures in my life already and also learned a lot of things and so i'm always constantly trying to share and so you know if there are younger designers that i come in contact with i always try to start those conversations and ask like what where are they in their journey and try to understand how i can not only learn from them but you know maybe impart something that i've learned myself that can prevent them from future failures <laughs> so are you saying you're open to someone maybe uh you know ping you and and ask you can you be my mentor of course <laughs> yes i love to talk about art and design and like how we can all just become better and do more for you know our our industry so definitely yes reach out <laughs> yes. esther do you have a question I absolutely do. Um, first of all, I just want to um, reaffirm the conversation being had about the importance of exposure to people who look like us in these sorts of arts careers so that there is motivation for somebody to kind of dig a little, you know, hear about what other open doors there are. Um, I feel like sharing that there is this parent. Um, she came here from um, mainland China and we met because I was working at uh, an arts and culture community center. 
and she's now asking me to kind of um, sort of tutor her kid or her daughter um, twice a week in music and poetry. And I I love on one I, for one I love that she asked that because I. I can't do like math and science, that's just me, but I love that she wanted to make sure this side of her daughter was getting nurtured. She was like, my daughter's kind of shy, you know, she's in choir, but I want her to like um, find some means of expression here. And um, it was really interesting when I kind of asked about her favorite like movies and um, songs. And it was interesting because when it came to novels, her favorites were like Little House on the Prairie, um, you know, just like you read and you don't see pictures. But when it came to her favorite singers, she mentioned um, Asian cover artists. Um, like there's this Korean cover artist who covered a Passion Fruit by Drake. And um, this girl, she like has no idea who Drake is, but she knows like this singer, I like her. And I like the songs that she sings. And I was like, that means so much, you know? Mm -hmm. It means so much to be able to see a face that um, we that we see ourselves in. So um, one question I had for you though was, you know, when it comes to places where we need to be um, persistent but also um, be intuitive, uh, what does it look like to balance the two? So for example, when you were applying to companies, I'm curious about how many companies you had to apply to, um, you know, how you kind of kept a finger on the slight differences between what each company wanted, how long that mm -hmm. took, what was the process like? Yeah, um, I would say that the process looked very different from when I was first starting out, like before Blue Wolf and after graduating, to what I do now. Um, so I'll give you what I do now because I think it's much better than what I was doing before. Before, you know, I was applying to like 60 companies and I was totally playing the numbers game. But these days I've realized that it's definitely about quality over quantity. And so how I would approach it is, the first thing is to have a really clear set of criteria for yourself of what you're looking for in your next role, in the company, in what you're hoping to achieve and learn out of this next opportunity. Because I, I often see, you know, people in situations where they're not quite happy and I think it's because they don't know, they didn't know what they wanted going into it. And so they went into it and then they're getting something that like is totally unexpected and not what they had intended. And so if you can, uh, you know, do some soul searching and see what that clear list of criteria is for you. So for example, for me right now, I need to work at a company that values brand and values design. Um, that's like top of my list. And so at ServiceNow, the leadership values brand. And so that was like a clear yes um, for when I joined. So after you have that clear set of criteria, the second thing is, you know, just put yourself out there, like reach out to your networks and of course apply, um, but apply intentionally to the companies that, you know, fit those criteria. Maybe they have a mission that you care about or have the same values as you do. Um, but on top of applying, you know, sometimes you might not know exactly what you want. And what I mean by that is, like I had never heard of Blue Wolf before, I had never heard of ServiceNow before. And so just let your networks know and just let people know that you're interested and you know those opportunities might come to you. And actually, uh, I think a lot of people think about LinkedIn as a great source, and I think it is. But beyond that, another thing that I recommend is uh, check out Twitter. There were a bunch of people at Facebook um, when I was contracting there who found their Facebook contract on Twitter. Like they followed these designers on Twitter and um, the designers would post these opportunities that actually sometimes don't show up on job boards because they're moving so fast and trying to fill these contracts. And so they DM to this person on Twitter and that's how they got their Facebook contract. Um, so use, use social media. It's definitely a great resource. Um, and so I think that's my, most of my tips for when it comes to interviewing. Those are really solid tips. Um, I wouldn't have thought of using Twitter and social media, but it makes a lot of sense, you know, mm -hmm. for a fast moving project to keep keep your head in social media, follow mm -hmm. the right people. Um, I believe we have a question uh, from Ann. Do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and just ask yourself? <laughs> Yeah, hey Emma, it's Anne. Um, my question is, uh, since the iterative process is such a huge part to the design uh, and creative world, 
how have you learned to take feedback and do you have a story where you've really learned to react or respond to things, especially trying to balance your design flair with the client's wants? Mm, that is a great question. I honestly love critiques and I think it helps that I go into critiques with the mindset of like, oh, I'm going to learn from this. Or they might say something that perhaps is, you know, perhaps I don't disagree with or I don't, you know, agree with. Um, but I try not to react to that right away and just answer with questions, right? And try to understand why they are saying certain feedback um, and why they are saying certain critique to understand where it's coming from in the first place. And not only, I think, does that give me one a moment to kind of process what they just said, but it also sometimes leads to a better understanding of what they're really looking for. So, you know, maybe it's not that they don't like the color red, but maybe it's backed by their experiences of like, you know, in the previous research that we did, like it read didn't perform well, so and so. And so I think coming into critiques with the mindset of trying to understand definitely helps in, you know, receiving that feedback much better. Thank you. Yeah, and I think a, a big part of it too is like, I. <sighs> As a creative, it's so easy to attach yourself to your work or thinking that, you know, what you made is a definition of who you are and your self-worth. But uh, you got to detach yourself from that, right? Like, like the thing that you made now, after this conversation and after iteration, it's only going to get better. And so it's not a definition of who you are and what you're worth. And so if you, you know, if you do attach yourself to that, it's really easy to think of it like, oh, that's you're like attacking me and like my taste. But um, coming at it from a detached point of view is, is keeps your sanity. <laughs> that's good advice because I think as artists or as anyone who, you know, puts anything out there, we do take it personally, right? <laughs> we do, we do feel like, oh my gosh, it's yeah. about people are judging me right now. Yeah. <laughs> right. But it's so, like just a moment in time. Yeah. Um, so we're going to be launching a little poll to ask our audience, um, you know, to give us a feed feedback for today's programming, but we'll, we'll continue with the questions. So uh, I think Esther has some more fascinating questions for you, Emma. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So um, since you've, you know, touched on the topic of self-worth, but also how to detach ourselves from, you know, receiving a certain feedback, I'm going to ask the big question and ask, you know, how you decide your rate, what factors uh, do you consider? Should years of experience matter? Everything. Sure. Yeah. I love that question because, you know, we need to, we need to talk about that more often in our industry because it's always that question that you want at the top of your head, but you know, sometimes you're afraid to ask it. Um, I think the, the most important thing is actually external factors, things that you don't have control over. Um, the market rate, what does that look like? And so if that's something that I didn't really do early in my career, I did not do market research. Definitely, you know, when I started contracting and interviewing, I did my homework. And so, you know, check out, uh, I think LinkedIn has a salary section, salary.com. I love Glassdoor. Glassdoor, you know, in their job postings, they even show you what the range for that role should be um, based on their data. And so, you know, do market research, uh, but beyond what you can see online, ask other people. I actually asked around and people told me, you know, uh, what they were getting paid, what, what they knew other people were getting paid. And there's uh, Facebook community, creative Facebook communities that would have conversations around this. And so you can collect your own data that way. And, you know, after having that information, then you can test the waters. Um, and so, you know, you also have to figure out what you need as well. So I have this, I, I came up with this like Google Sheets calculator where I put in like, okay, I'm going to put so much into, you know, my 401k or I need this much for food. So you need to know what your number is to like survive and, and then some. <laughs> so that's kind of like the, the external factors that I think is actually the most important thing in your rate. And then the second piece of it is, you know, because we are in the, the arts and creativity, it's about the quality of your work. That's, I would say that's one of the most important things is like what you're delivering. And I, there's, there's two ways to look at it. There's like the way of like, how do I see the quality of my work? But 
which is like the more, you know, common way. But I think the more important thing to consider is like, what do other people value my work as? Because you can have two clients. One person might not value art and design as much and he'll think you're worth like $50 an hour. And then the other client will be like, no, I know that this is going to be, you know, it's going to lead to more revenue for me and I'm going to pay you $100 an hour. And so that kind of affects how much you charge as well. So for example, I don't, I wouldn't charge, um, a mom and pop shop the same amount that I would charge a huge tech company, right? So that that's something to consider as well when it when you're thinking about the quality of your work and the client that you're you're working with. And then I think the last thing is then years of experience. Like uh, I think years of experience, you know, especially when you're a younger designer, you might think that that's like the most important thing and that's what people look for. And it is a consideration, right? Like I'm I think I'm more valuable now that I've gone through that six months at Pinterest. <laughs> Right. Um, and having learned how to do the photo shoot mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter as much as you think it does because for example um, let's say you know we have a young designer maybe two years in and we have a uh, seasoned 15 years designer depending who you're applying to if you're applying to a youthful startup right they're maybe going to lean towards a younger designer who's willing to say yes who's willing to try things and who's like in with the trends compared to like somebody who may, you know, been jaded after working for so many years. So those are the kinds of things to consider in terms of years of experience, but I definitely put it lower in the list behind the quality of work. Thanks for such solid advice. Um, what I'm kind of hearing that, you know, stood out to me is that you think a lot about the impact um, on both ends, like for yourself, what you need, what you need mm -hmm. the financial revenue to be for yourself but also what the company um, or the mom and pop sh uh, shop might take from that. So when you mentioned that you would charge, you know, a huge, a huge company more than a mom and pop shop, is it kind of because you're looking at what they can each afford or more because you're considering the overall impact your design can take on? There's a, there's multiple factors into it. One of them is how much they can afford, but the other, element to it is how much value they're getting out of it so mm. a mom and pop shop maybe there's only one location and maybe whatever you're creating for them is just for that specific moment in time and that place and that location but for a bigger company they may take your artwork and it may be um, displayed on their advertising in different countries and they're putting it in their events and they're putting it on stickers and so they're getting much more mileage out of it just because they're at a operating at a bigger scale and so they're getting more value out of it. And so it just, you know, you got to match that value as well. Makes sense. There's a balance to everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, uh, it's, I guess it's like one of the business side of things. Mm -hmm. Sorry, was there more you were going to say there? I don't want to interrupt you. No, that's it. Thank okay. you. Uh, we have another question from Facebook. Um, the question is, how do you handle clients that you feel are short selling your work, trying to lowball your proposed rates? Um, well, I think two things. One is I would, if I really want to work with them, then I will question further, you know, like why, where they're coming from with that number. And then maybe we can meet somewhere that feels comfortable for the both of us. If it's a client where they're lowballing because it's a reflection of the fact that they don't value design and it's probably not going to be a good engagement for us to begin with, then mm -hmm. I'll just say, okay, well, good luck finding someone. <laughs> wow. I think that's, that's really important to, to turn down jobs that you feel is not a right fit because oftentimes you end up paying at the back end when you just stretch yourself too far and decide to work with people that, that you don't feel energetically um, positive with, right? Mm -hmm. so I think that's very smart. And I also appreciate you saying that you, you know, for a smaller company or say a nonprofit like Chopsticks Alley, you mm -hmm. charge us, you know, rates that are, would be affordable for our organization. And I think that's this, a sense of you giving back. And um, right, don't you think that as we achieve success in our lives, that giving back is an absolutely important thing to do? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so another question I have for you is, let's say money is no object whatsoever and you could redo your entire <laughs> life all over again. What career would you choose? Well, I, 
I didn't choose design knowing that it was going to get paid well, honestly. Um, so, and I love it. So I think I would still stay in design. Although if you want like a non-design <laughs> answer. Um, no, I want your true answer. So if that is your answer. Okay. Yeah, that, that is my answer. Yeah, I didn't go into it thinking that I was going to get paid well. Um, I just chose <laughs> it because it just felt right, you know, and I was like interested in it. Um, but it just turned out that it was good. <laughs> that's perfect. And, and that's what the advice we would want for young people and also parents to keep in mind is, I think when you pursue something that you love, the money will come, you know? I agree. I think so. Because like, honestly, I'm so obsessed with design. Like I spend so much time reading up more about it. And I think it just like it continues to level me up and it just is then reflected in the, the opportunities that I get. That's right. Because you would be willing to stay up late at night, work as hard as you can. Like, so what, how can you not be the best at that if it's a passion? Right. Where, mm -hmm. I mean, like, I know I've been in jobs I didn't really like. I don't want to wake up. I don't want, you know, when I ended up doing something I love, I'm like up at 5 a.m. I'm doing <laughs> right. it. So yeah, it looks like, oh, Charlie did it. It's so easy, but it isn't. It isn't easy, but because I put a lot of time and effort into it, it looks easy. But that's because you're doing something you love, right? Um, and do we have any more audience questions? Because we're reaching towards the end here, but we, we welcome engagement from everyone. Um, and then any last thoughts actually um, from you, Emma, for parents, last thought for parents. It's important, especially in the Asian um, household, right? How much our parents have influenced us. And mm -hmm. then for the young people who either uh, have supportive parents or don't have supportive parents. So let's start with uh, what are your last thoughts for parents who are uh, concern about their kids pursuing the arts? Uh, my last thoughts for parents again is just to to be supportive and to listen and to be optimistic because I know it's hard if your kid is you know is struggling and still figuring it out but as long as they're trying different things and learning what doesn't work eventually it'll lead to something that does work so um, keep being patient and being supportive. <laughs> Thanks. They'll get there. <laughs> so the second half of the question is, um, so you're, you're younger and you want to pursue the arts and you do not have supportive family. Mm -hmm. I, even if you don't have a supportive family, I think there are so many different people that you can surround yourself with to, you know, increase your support in other ways and so for me it was a lot of my friends like Catherine leading me in the right direction and so you can get it from you know your friends you can get it from communities like Chopsticks Alley there's so many different organizations out there that will allow you to you know expose yourself to these different experiences and kind of you know, allow you to explore more and so um, the world is big so look out there and then for those who are lucky enough to have um, a supportive family what advice do you have for them? Well, keep keep going. Um, <laughs> I think just keep exploring and keep uh, keep learning. I think having like that, you know, curiosity and this love for learning throughout your life. Like it doesn't stop when you're in high school. It doesn't stop when you're done with college. It, it keeps going. And if you kind of have that, I think curiosity then it'll just lead you to even bigger opportunities down your entire life. Thank you so much. And Esther, do you have any last thoughts for our audience? I know you're a singer songwriter yourself, so you're also a working artist. Um, you know, any last thoughts, advice? Uh, Emma, I really appreciate you mentioning how important the internal certainty is important to you know, establish in ourselves before we, you know, really go out. Like, yeah, the world is big, but I love that you were like, do some soul searching, ask what you really want, and then make your move. I think that that is something I always have to remember <laughs> every single day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, we have um, an audience, Anne, who asks uh, if, we, if you could teach an art class. <laughs> Yeah. You know, at Chelsea Sally, I've been asking, I've been asking her for a while. So maybe that's your next calling, huh? 
Oh my gosh, Anne's so funny. Yes, I'm actually doing a, a calligraphy class for Anne next week, so. Ah, oh, can we televise it? Oh my gosh, okay, we'll take that <laughs> offline. We'll we're take gonna, that offline. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna, you know, make it live stream and then have uh, Create TV, put it on cable, channel 30. By the way, our audience, we wanna say hi to everyone who's watching. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us today, Emma, uh, and sharing your experience. And Emma says she is free to um, you know, take on any kind of uh, mentorship. <laughs> yes, feel free to reach out. Yeah, maybe we can share with the audience uh, contact info for Emma. And then for Chopsticks Alley, we always welcome your ideas and input. Thank you for answering the polls. We have a few folks who have not voted. You have like a few minutes left please help us because it helps us with getting grants so we can continue to, to do these programs and for those who would like to have an internship uh, with chopsticks alley we welcome that as well uh, we can expose you to all kinds of interesting things in the art world though right now it is limited but we've managed to uh, still explore the, the you know the virtual world we have an upcoming um, exhibit that we're going to be doing virtually uh, a, a virtual gallery and it would be very exciting and maybe we could, could feature some of your uh, very fun designs on there too. Emma. Sure. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yes. And so Esther, if you could share the last screen and we're going to say goodbye to our audience and I know Michelle, thanks for joining us and putting yourself on camera. We appreciate that. Everyone else is hiding probably in their pajamas. <laughs> That's what I'd be doing. <laughs> Um, so um, with that, let me see, we have a few more comments, uh, everyone's saying bye. So thank you for this event. Someone says thank you, Emma, for sharing your journey, um, thanking us for putting it on, uh, great advice, uh, and then Emma, you're amazing. So there you go. Thank so you. bye, everyone.